studying this fall at Purdue University. It's a pleasure to have uh, Eddie come back. Also, Eddie was a few, the previous uh, Matthew Russell. <laughs> he is one of the uh, uh, former organizers of this famous seminar. Uh, as usual, we're going to take a, a, the speaker to dinner. If you'd like to join us at the usual place, let me know immediately after the talk. And reminding you, no electronic devices. Uh, in this seminar. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Z, for the invitation. Uh, thank you. It's always a pleasure to be at the Experimental Math Seminar, uh, even more so as a speaker. Uh, so thanks. Um, I'm going to be talking today about a combinatorial approach to hypermatrix algebra. And this was very much inspired by a paper uh, that Dr. Z written about a combinatorial approach to matrix algebra. Uh, so I will emphasize the connection by slowly warming up. And I invite questions at any point during the talk. Um, the results are not too hard to prove once you get the idea. So here's the plan. We're going to quickly go from matrix product to hypermatrix product. to go to hypermatrix product. And then the second thing we want to um, discuss is going to be the combinatorial lens at linear algebra. And finally, hopefully we get to the Katie Hamilton theorem. And if I can make it this far before the 48 minutes, um, we could discuss even more. As I said, questions are welcome at any point during the talk. All right, so let's warm up uh, by reviewing matrix multiplication and by no means insulting <laughs> your intelligence. Uh, it's merely to emphasize the combinatorial depiction. So if you think about matrix multiplication, here's a mnemonic device I use, which is helpful to remember it if you forget it. But more importantly, it actually facilitates the digestion of the generalization. So typically, here's how I start. I want to compute the entry CMN. I'm going to write sum over k. Instead of zero. And here's the typo I'm going to make on purpose. And then uh, what I say to the students is cross out this n and change it into a k. And cross out uh, this m and change it into a k. OK, so note that I did not cross the same index. I started here, I made an arbitrary choice, but I crossed out the second index here, and here I crossed out the first index. All right. You could have defined matrix multiplication by crossing out the first index and crossing out here the second, but you would have flipped the order. Yeah, so, it was capital K? Yes. So K is the index. So let me say something about the matrices. Okay, okay. Uh, so capital K is the number of entries. So in the case, so for example, the matrix A is uh, capital M by capital K matrix. And the matrix B is capital K by capital M matrix. It's just to help the indexing. So little m is going to go all the way up to capital M. Little m is going to go all the way to capital M. OK, so a gadget construction which is useful in the teaching linear algebra is the following. So I'm going to pass this around. Uh, this just merely emphasizes that the location of every entry in the answer is sort of an intersection of two rays, one coming from the rows of A and one coming from the columns of B. And every entry is sort of identified by this scheme. 
Okay, so this is useful, and you would see why in a second. You can pass this around. Now the point is, let's use this mnemonic device to suggest how we would naturally generalize matrix multiplication. So instead, I'm going to write this. DMNP is going to be sum over K, less than capital K is to zero. And I'm going to make the same mistake. You got AMNP, BMNP, CMNP. This is ternary. Let me erase here. Let me erase this second guy just by mimicking what I did there. Change this into a K. Since I have to not do it for the same index, I'm going to change this guy into a K. And here, the first one is going to turn into a K. Okay, so here I'm saying that if you want to do the product, which is noted this way, D is circle of A, B, C. A is a capital M by capital K by capital B. B is a capital M by capital N by capital K. And C is capital K by capital N by capital P. So just as for matrices, there are constraints which tie the matrices you can multiply, namely that the number of columns must match the number of rows. Here there are constraints which tie these, let's call them for the sake of the conversation, rows. These guys are going to be um, columns, and these guys I'm going to call them depth. I'm going in the depth direction. So there is a connection relating the three of them. The k here must be the same, but there are also pairwise constraints. The m relates only a and b, and the n relates c and b, and finally p relates a and C. Now this seems somewhat artificial. Uh, can I come up with a gadget that is analogous to the one I sent you? Unfortunately, you can. It's slightly more involved, but it's fun to see for once. So let me show you what the gadget looks like. So it looks like <laughs> Sorry. You will get this passing around. So you can see in the gadget for matrices, one of the dimensions is cheated. There's nothing coming from the depth direction. So the, re the way you want to think about this is, this is what I want to compute. This is D. And D is sort of squeezed out by three hypermatrices. All right, so. Right. And here's what you should think about. In the matrix case, you had these two. I, I don't know if you can see them. But in the matrix case, you had two of them. You didn't have the third dimension to play with. In other words, you had A and B, but you didn't have this C. The C is the one on top. So you should think about them as each one of them feeding some sort of lasers. And fortunately, I have some visual depiction of those. So let me pass these around. These are supposed to depict the cube, so you get to see them for yourself. And you have the figures to pass around as well. So the point is that the first A is going to feed rows, B is going to feed depths, and C is going to feed columns. And what is interesting is that if the entries of A of B is completely one, you go back to matrix multiplication. So matrix multiplication is a special case of this product. All right. Well, one no. question. Sure. Uh, so, you know, this is more more common, but like, the, like, like the order that we put the K's just doesn't feel natural to me. Like, yes. like, 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 I'd rather put like the K in the third in the slot first. for the A, the second slot for the B, and the first slot for a C. So you would want to put the K here? I yeah 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 like like three two one. So you know, because like two three one feels awkward, I guess. <laughs> so so definitely the argument here is that would have been perfectly valid as well. Okay. There is. There's an arbitrary choice you have to make. 
And when we wrote the paper, this was what felt natural. But there's no reason for picking one and not picking the other, as long as you're consistent. Okay. So for the purpose of this conversation, this is uh, what we did. But really, the motivation for me was here. I crossed out the second one, so I wanted to cross out the second one here. <laughs> you're crying. And the crossing last out. one, I crossed out the first one. So for the last one, I also wanted to cross out the first one. But this is just for me saying. If B was all one, then I recover matrix multiplication. Okay. Right. Yes. Does this have a history at all in terms of yes. tensor contraction? Yes, 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 yes. And I should say this. This is very important. So this, def, this does have a history. It, this multiplication was proposed in the 90s by uh, Messner and Bhattacharya. So Messner and And the 90s actually suggested this multiplication. And this came out as they were studying what's called in combinatorics association schemes. Association schemes. So association schemes is, is this field of combinatorics which actually comes from statistics, where you want to design an experiment and partition the samples so, and so as to minimize the bias you introduce. And it came from a very practical field of agriculture. They wanted to partition the land, try different experiments, and they did not want to introduce bias by their partitioning scheme. So how should you partition your, your experiment? The design of the theory, which was proposed by Bose back at the time, heavily built on properties of finite fields and matrix algebra. So matrix multiplication is tied to the study of association schemes. But association schemes historically have been studying pairs. You partition and you study the influence of pairs. And what Bessner Bhattacharya wanted to do in the 90s was to study association schemes of triplets. And very naturally, they were led to this multiplication. Though be it, they made a different choice of convention. For example, they, they deleted this guy. This is the first K, and so on. However, we did not know about this when we started working on, on the topic. Now, association schemes are combinatorial objects, and I promised the combinatorial depiction for what we're going to do. And the combinatorial understanding is not going to be via association scheme. It's going to be via graph theory. So let's get into the graph theory part of the picture. To get a sense of how you go from matrices to graph, uh, this was suggested by Danish Koenig. And he suggested a construction known as the Koenig bipartite, bipartite directed graphs. And what a Koenig directed graph is, is for a matrix A, which is let's say capital M by capital N, you construct a bipartite graph with N vertices, say R0, R1, all the way up to R capital M minus 1. These are vertices which are <coughs> identified with the rows of the matrix. And you have vertices that you identify with the column C0, C1, all the way up to Cn minus 1. And every entry of the matrix, let me write here Ri, let me write here Cj, every entry of the matrix is an edge which goes from the rows to the columns. So this is a complete bipartite graph, and the edges going from R0 to R1 are labeled by entries of your matrix. So this is entry Ij. What's convenient with this graph as opposed to the adjacency matrix graph adjacency depiction is that you can encode rectangular matrices without worry. And what adjacency matrix does is really identify these two vertices together. So if you had a square matrix, then you can say, well, I'm identifying C0 and R0, and you're back to the adjacency matrix depiction. Now, this was studied in combinatorics, and most of the discussion in Dr. Z's paper 
was about the properties you can derive from this. From this, how you could depict the Kelly Hamilton uh, theorem using properties of graphs. So now that we've defined what it is, how we go from a matrix to a graph, what does this have to do with multiplication? How do we understand matrix multiplication using these? So since I came early, <laughs> in the interest of time, I did these drawings, and they happen to be useful. So. You depict A, in the case of two by two matrices, you depict A as a two by two matrix. So it's going to have two rows, two columns. B, in red here, is going to be an, an also a two by two matrix. And to do the multiplication, Koenig suggested to identify, to do this identification scheme. Column zero is going to be identified to row zero. Column one is going to be identified to row one. And now the result of the matrix multiplication was if you wanted to know entry zero A or C, 0, 1, you had to look at the contribution of all the paths which leave 0 and end up at 1. And if you're going along a path, you multiply the weights of the edges that are on the path. All right? So this was the Koenig gadget construction for doing matrix multiplication. And you can see here why, when you compute A squared, you're saying something about paths of length 2. And if you're computing A cubed, you're saying something about paths of length 3. Really because you're gluing these graphs together. So what I want you to do is think about, instead of think about path, think about triangles. Every term in the product, let's think about it as building a triangle configuration where the back edge is the result of your multiplication. So if you wanted to compute the entry 0, 0 of the product, you would have to add this triangle configuration, which is A0 times B0. And you would add this triangle configuration. Now, you can see already that matrix multiplication sort of involved these sort of tripartite graphs. And these tripartite graphs induce natural three uniform hypergraphs. So you have triangles instead of edges if you look at this configuration. So if we wanted to define a conic directed graph for a hypergraph, here's what we would do. So given a hypermatrix, given um, M by N by P hypermatrix, And what I mean by hypermatrix is essentially this block of cube that you, you have. Three-dimensional array of numbers. You can associate with it a tripartite, three-uniform hypergraph. So consider the tripartite directed three-uniform Hypergraph. And here, naturally, what you would do is something very analogous to what we did here. You would have a collection of vertices for the rows. Row n minus 1. You would have a collection of vertices for the columns. And you will finally have another collection of vertices for the depth. D0 all the way up to D P minus 1. And the point is that entry I, J, K of your hypermatrix is going to be a triangle, a directed triangle in your three uniform hypergraph. Now this looks quite similar to this. And the theme is going to carry. If you know how to multiply, how to interpret this combinatorially, it would give you a combinatorial interpretation for multiplying hypermatrices of order 4. And that's easy to see once we see the picture. So how many, how many given our hypermatrix for this to work, to work out, let's check how many hyperedges can we have in our three uniform hyper. 
Is it clear how many hyperedges we can have? How many triangles can we build? M and T. Exactly. And M and T corresponds to the number of entries. So we have a bijective proof <laughs> that we can indeed associate these guys. Now the question is, how does this tripartite graph, which we want to think of as a generalization of this, how does that relate to the multiplication operation which we described? What's nice about the conic directed graph is that matrix multiplication amounts to this identification scheme, which allows us to understand the edges of the result as paths. Now, a similar thing can be done here. If you have triangles that you're identifying, well, it turns out you're building tetrahedrons. Uh -oh. <laughs> so in the other case, we were building paths. Here, you're building tetrahedrons. And to see how you build a tetrahedron, consider a, a hypergraph which had only one non-zero entry in A, one non-zero entry in B, and only one non-zero entry in C. And let's assume that that non-zero entry was for some value of k, so I can erase this sum. You only have one non-zero entry for a specific value of k, then the product, the answer, is going to be the product of these three numbers. Now, look at what happened. We're saying that the vertices m and m have to be identified. We're saying that the vertices p and p here have to be identified as well. And finally, we're saying that n, so you have n here and n have to be identified. And what you're actually doing is building this triangle m and p. And this k, this k, this k, the red guy, is where these three tetrahedron meet on the top. Right? So every term in here, just as in matrix multiplication, every term is the triangle configuration. Every term in this product is building a tetrahedron. All right? So the combinatorial interpretation here is going to help us because if matrix multiplication allowed us to count paths for graphs which had zero one entries, this multiplication is going to allow us to count how many tetrahedral synthesis we have. Okay, so let me pass this around so you can see. Now, there are properties of this algebra which are convenient or inconvenient, depending on how you want to look at it. First of all, it's not associative. So if you multiply hypermatrices, the parentization scheme matters. And the way I think of it is, hypermatrix multiplication breaks the symmetry in the parentization. Now this turns out to be useful. If these tetrahedral simplices that you build, they actually allow you to build very specific objects. So suppose I wanted to build this simplex. This is a tetrahedral simplex that I build by gluing one tetrahedron onto another. And this corresponds to a very specific parentization scheme for, for building this. And I will write it down. So suppose I wanted to build this by gluing triangles. How should I do the sequence of products? If I wanted to build that shape, using the minimum number of triangles without degeneracy, here's the number of uh, multiplication and the sequence of multiplication I would need. So I would need 7 by 7. So A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I are all 7 by 7 by 7 hypermatrices. Okay. More importantly, the only non-zero entry of A is A562. So let's put this symbolically. Everything else is zero. The only non-zero entry of B is B516. So by the way, this is hard to figure out. It's not, if you don't have a computer, it could take a while. But once you know how it works, it's easy to find out. So, 6, C has only 6, 1, 2, D has only 3, 5, 2, uh, E has only 3, 1, 5, F has only, the non-zero entry is 0, 4, 3, G, sorry, it's almost done, 0, 1, 4, H is 4, 1, 3, I has only 0, 3, 2, and the sequence of products that you have to make is exactly this one. 
Uh, let me write it here. It's the following sequence. So we're going to multiply i with the result of f g h. The whole thing has to be multiplied by d e and a b c. <coughs> One, two, three. All right. Any other thing you do, you get zero. You get the all zero. So the sequence says, first do ABC. Once you're done doing ABC, you have the tetrahedron coming from ABC. You're going to glue that to DE, to some face of DE. And then the results, you have to build this tetrahedron independently and glue the whole thing together to one of the faces of I. And this is exactly what you hold. <laughs> so the point is that if you do this sequence of products where you do the, the parallelization scheme matter, you're actually building simplices and you're counting how many simplices there are. Now, so this is a seven by seven matrix. Yes, 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 yes. One non zero entry. Exactly, only one non zero entry. And, and, and the, the non zero entry is the product of all these variables. Right. Everything else is zero. All right, so now we pointed out that you can build tetrahedral simplices, and if your hypermatrix was zeros and ones, you're counting the number of tetrahedral simplices that you can build. So now, we sort of boil down the pieces for expressing a Katie Hamilton theorem. And I think we have enough time to cover our basics. All right. So let's quickly review what Katie Hamilton says for matrices and how one could think about it. Kelly Hamilton is this very fascinating theorem which essentially argues that if you took the sequence, you start with a matrix A. Let's say that the matrix has real entries and it's an n by n. Kelly Hamilton says if you took the sequence of powers A to the K and you went up to n squared. I want to be. Now, so you know by the fact that A is an n by n matrix, it has n square entries. If you pick n square plus one of them, they must be linearly dependent. But Kelly Hamilton says more. It says that n plus one suffice. If you take a sequence of powers, right, so the span, then you write it. So the max. Dimension of the span 